This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. With 45 days of food crammed into their 17-foot kayaks, Will Copestake and his friend Seamus began an 840-kilometer expedition through the icy fjords of Chilean Patagonia, a perfect harmony of the brutal and the beautiful, as Will writes at his website, willcopestakemedia.com. Will previously appeared in episode 53, talking about his Scotland kayaking and Monroe bagging adventure, which you can find at thepursuitzone.com slash tpz053. Will Copestake, welcome back to the show. Hi, Paul. Nice to, nice to be back on the show. Will, why did you want to do this particular Chilean Patagonia adventure? For me, it's, uh, I've been working down in Patagonia now for two years or two seasons. So my winter in Scotland, I go down and enjoy the, the Patagonian summer, inverted commas. It's generally quite wet and windy during the summer down there. And for me, if you're guiding, you're always working the same area and you get to know a small area really well. And uh, when I was working down in, in the south near the, the Torres del Paine range, I was always looking at these hills and over the hills. And you can see on the maps these great fjords and glaciers that are just totally unreachable apart from going by your own steam or from local fishing boats, which is quite hard to organize. And so for me, it was about getting out and seeing what was beyond the hills and what was in those fjords. And uh, I just kind of wanted to satisfy a curiosity, really. How did you end up getting this uh, kayaking guiding job? Uh, it came about uh, after the, the expedition, which I talked about in the, the last interview with you. So when I finished kayaking around Scotland and doing the hills, I, I needed to do something and more importantly, needed to make an income. And so I started looking quite frantically about what to do. And the idea of guiding came up. And a friend of a friend who'd been down there about five years before me suggested Patagonia. And so I applied and funny enough, didn't get the job because they'd already filled up. And then three weeks before the season started, a, a guy dropped out and I got a phone call and had three weeks to, to get down there. And so I said, yeah, great. And just jumped into it. Um, I never regretted it, really. Enjoyed the first season and came back for a second. And hopefully I'll be back down again for more in the future. I'm kind of curious about uh, the type of clients that you get. Do you get experienced kayaking clients or do you get total um, beginners or does it run the wide range? It's a little bit of everything, really. So the company I work for is Tutravezia. They advertise mostly sort of mini expedition tours. So anything from two to four days along a, a river system uh, called the Rio Serrano. And you start off by icebergs right in front of Torres del Paine, which is one of Patagonia's real gem mountain ranges. And you go down this river, which is quite a gentle river, actually. It's only a grade one or two, if you know your kayaking terms, which is roughly flat water. But what you do get is really, really strong winds, everything up to sort of 30, 35 knots. And so it's interesting in that the clients you get are often experienced, but more often than not, I would say they're beginners or very, very inexperienced paddlers. And you just rely on having a small group and being able to manage and tow people. Um, but generally, you can get anyone from a beginner to an expert down it and have an awful lot of fun. Do you have an opportunity to speak to the clients before they maybe before they get on a plane or whatever to come down there? And and if you do, I'm just wondering what kind of are what's like the most common question that they ask. It's uh, it's funny, really. You get I've got a great list of really funny questions like. Uh, People have asked on the river, at what point do you get back to the start? Uh, what altitude we are at sea level? Uh, so you get some really interestingly funny questions from people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't really get a chance to, to speak to most folk before the tours because what they often do is they fly down to do hiking and they'll come on to the kayaking tours almost an afterthought or as a sort of secondary part to their trip. And we ask them a small amount of questions about their experience and about kind of what paddling they've done. But it's all relative, really. People will, will say their experience if they feel experienced where they might not be, or they'll say they're inexperienced when they're actually experts. Generally, I'll assess everything and sort of ask some questions and talk to them on the first day's paddling of the trips, where the option is if they aren't 
aren't up to it then is we can then spread it out over a few more days or in the worst case scenario arrange for a speedboat to come and get us um, but touch wood have never had to do that yet so tell me a little bit about Seamus who joined you on this expedition so Seamus is my my best and oldest friend we grew up together in the, in the northwest of Scotland and spent most of our childhood together getting wet and cold or lighting bonfires on the beach uh, and it's really with Seamus that I, I thank to getting me outside in the first place. I think having a friend to grow up with, to go and explore and sort of push your boundaries and limits really is, is the best way to encourage you to do something. And so Seamus, we'd originally planned a trip in Norway because um, we decided we really want to do a, an expedition together and always had done. And the idea was we would go in June to Norway, which we actually did after the Patagonia trip. And as an afterthought, I sort of suggested, well, come down and join me on a, an expedition in Patagonia. And so he, he did. And he, he said, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll join and flew down uh, with very little idea about what we were sort of getting into, apart from a couple of emails, and just kind of went into it with a, a sort of good, good outlook and sort of positive, positive mindset. Um, but I knew growing up with him he was a very strong paddler so we were we knew before we'd begun that we'd be a strong team uh, reading through your blog because you are working down there as a guide it sounded like your equipment was a little um you had a little bit better equipment than Seamus had coming down how how did his equipment and his experience compare to yours with the, the company we had the company actually has really quite good kit in that it's got dry suits uh Kokotat dry suits and decent kayaks, so plastic kayaks, are P&H Scorpio kayaks, which are quite small volume. And what we did is we, we used the better ones of those from the company uh, for Seamus. I thankfully have got quite a nice deal with Kokotat and various other companies, Werner and, and such, that I can get equipment for myself. So I had quite new, new gear for myself. Uh, but Seamus was using the, the client equipment, which obviously is a little bit more used. And so we borrowed that for him. Uh, the boats we had weren't ideal for a long expedition either and being fairly low volume. But at the end of the earth, it's quite hard to get these sort of things. And in terms of experience, like I say well, I grew up paddling with Seamus. And we did quite a lot of river kayaking together. But his longest expedition up until the point we'd begun this one was uh, a five-day trip around our local islands, the Summer Isles. So it was quite a big step for him. But like I say more than, more than comfortable with it. Uh, we, we just had a blast. What fresh perspective did Seamus bring to the team? For me, I'd done a long trip before. And so without really realizing, came into this mindset of passage. Um, a passage is just kind of you set your distance where you want to get each day and you kind of start doing that. And you, of course, enjoy the sights and exploring and seeing along the way. But your, your mindset becomes quite often just about sort of getting from A to B, which is not really what adventure is all about. And so Seamus, with his fresh look at things, really was encouraging us to kind of get in and get close. And we were exploring the coast and lingering a little bit more and really, really getting sort of delving full, full and deep into, into the environment that we put ourselves in. Did you guys establish a routine? And, and if you did, what, what was kind of your routine and what, what roles did each of you play uh, in your routine? Uh, we did. We got quite a good routine going in the end. So the main routine when you're paddling you basically just paddle together it's it's pretty straightforward you you set where you want to go and you you go in the course you want to take um, the routine comes in when it's getting ready in the morning and camping and so we'd have a system where when we landed I would start unloading my kayak and getting the tent set up where Seamus would start unloading his and he would either help with getting the tarpaulin up which is an extra space for us or he would get cooking duties so most of the trip, Seamus was boiling the water and cooking and making the coffees, whereas I was sorting the camp craft out. And uh, that system worked really well because you then get everything done faster and you'd be into your dry clothes or in the morning getting into your wet clothes a little bit quicker. Now, of course, we did share duties from time to time, but having a sort of system of what you're doing each morning or each evening makes life a lot smoother. Were you guys both in the Scorpio kayaks? We were, yeah. Um, so... Prior to him coming down, I'd managed to get the two the two Scorpios. Uh, so Tuchavezia had two Scorpio kayaks. Um, they had a whole range of different boats, mostly double kayaks for clients, which are more stable. Um, but these two Scorpios are the, the best expedition boats that they had. Um, they still are. They're very, very good boats. Um, and I, So I'd spent quite a lot of time outfitting them and getting them expedition ready. But our big problem was having 
low volume in them because they are, they were the lowest volume boats that Scorpio make or P and H make. What were you using for paddles? Uh, paddles we had Werner uh, Aquilos paddles, which are carbon fiber, really really nice blades. Slightly wider blades, which although add a little bit more resistance against the wind, uh, we we favoured for for having that extra grip in the way is an extra bracing power because when you get caught in a, a flurry of wind which is quite regular in the fjords down there it, it can become can become quite difficult to keep your kayak upright to say the least and so having that bracing power was was nice and in addition to that we had another set of um, paddles that we we had strapped on the the decks as spares just in case you lose or break one you named your boats wind and spin drift how did you come up with those names um, yeah, so we, we called them in Spanish. It was uh, Viento and La Vafagas. So Viento is wind and La Vafaga is uh, spindrift. Uh, and we called those as an homage to the, the weather that we were expecting to get. Um, we were actually very lucky on the trip. Overall, got a phenomenal weather window. Although we did get a, a bit of wind and spindrift, we managed to escape quite a lot of it. So we were, we were quite lucky that wind and spindrift really remained as our kayak names and less of the, the experience throughout. Reading through your blog uh i think this is the first time i i came across aqua seal i had i don't recall ever hearing about that before what is that and how did you have to use it um so aqua seal or seam seal is uh it's like a glue it's basically silicon glue and um, we found a shop that we you could buy it in it's used for repairing things like dry suits and putting neck seals on a dry suit and just gluing up dry bags and things with holes in but it became our kind of go-to repair thing we taped it onto everything for sealed boat hatches dry bags holes and dry suits um all sorts of stuff really so you wouldn't use it to patch a hole in a kayak no so with patching a hole in a kayak what i tend to use is different ways you can do it um now with a plastic kayak it's really quite unlikely you're going to put a hole in the plastic kayak they are by their very nature very rigid but where we we were going, um, particularly near glaciers and icebergs, icebergs can be really sharp, so it slightly rises that chance of putting a hole in. Uh, and also doing portages where you actually drag your boat over the land, um, which we did on three occasions, is another chance where you might be able to put a hole in. Um, now obviously, they weren't our boats, so we were being pretty careful at trying not to get holes in them, and thankfully didn't do. But if you do, we have things like Denso tape, which is sticky grease covered plumbing tape that you can make a temporary patch with and then later that night when you're on the beach if you did have a hole you you'd shave a little bit of plastic off the inside of the kayak and then melt that in to cover the hole so you're kind of welding it shut Um, we had the equipment for that but thankfully didn't need to use it well let's talk a little bit about the route that you went on and, and some of the challenges and the things that you saw out there and so on you start in puerto eden first of all how how do you describe that town Puerto Eden is, for me, like the wettest edge of the world. It is absolutely in the middle of nowhere. To get there, we started at Puerto Natales, which would be our finish point, and you get on a ferry. Now, we picked one of the last ferries of the season, um, which was what I had to do because it was the end of my working season. It takes you for 800 kilometers or so all the way up into Puerto Eden, which is a, a town of about 200 people. And the last refuge of the original indigenous tribes, the Cuesca Indian, now, Cuesca originally were the, the real true seafarers of Patagonia. They would travel by these large canoes. And unlike us, they could light fires in them, which was pretty comfortable. Um, but they were hard, hard people that survived in a very hard place. And so this little refuge town where there's no roads, only boardwalks to get around or by boat, really is the sort of last stronghold of them. It was great. We were given the chance to stay with one of them for a couple of days while we sorted out our naval permissions to be allowed to go. So what are the weather conditions like when you guys start out? Uh, The western fjords of Patagonia are by their very nature exceedingly wet. There's places in in the fjords out there that have averaged up to nine meters of rainfall in a year, which is up there with the wettest places on earth. Patagonia is famous for being really, really windy also. It's, uh, like I say, the average, average wind is over 20 knots during the summer. It gets very, very difficult to survive out there, really. Um, and you can get everything from snow showers to sunshine and back to r- rain and wind all within the space of half an hour. 
we had a joke when we, we started out there that you'd shout wind on and the wind would go on and then go wind off and it would stop literally in that sort of time span. And that wind would go from zero to 25, 30 knots in that space of time. Plus, we start, started off and unsurprisingly, it was pretty wet and remained wet for about the first week or so. But with the planning of the trip, we'd chosen to be on the edge of winter. Now, in winter in Patagonia, the weather actually gets a little bit kinder um, in a kayaker's point of view in that although it gets colder the wind drops and you're more likely to get longer stable periods of sunshine and the gamble is of whether or not you're going to get that stable period of no wind and a lot of rain or you're going to get that stable period of no wind and some sunshine we were lucky in that we we got a little bit more uh, sunshine than we did rain but nevertheless there's quite a lot of lot of water you're mentioning that you you were getting um, relentless rain and snow a week of that before you decide to, I think, break off more inland and uh, get some protection from the mountains. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so we, um, we'd we already planned a few portages. The portages are where you carry your kayak in land. And we got, we got a forecast. We had a little GPS thing, a company called Deloim, um, that you can send a sort of two-way text. It's a bit like Twitter. Uh, you get 140 characters, and we'd we'd made a code back home. So my dad was sending us a code of a five day forecast uh, every day, and um, so like we well, got this. Sorry, um, so like, uh, what's an example of the, what the code would be? So it started off. It would be five days. I so have the date, and then a general condition in terms of weather for the day. So an X would mean snow, R would be rain, S sun, C cloudy. Pretty simple, really. And then we would have a, an M, meaning morning, and then you'd have a four, four number uh, number, which would be the first two numbers would be the wind speed in a gust, and then the second two numbers would be the, the wind speed average. And then we'd have an L for lunchtime, and it'd be the same four numbers again, and then a, a D for dinner, um, which would be the same again. So you'd have three points of the day with the wind forecast. And then it would go to the next date and it would do the same again. And you could fit that into a five-day forecast that way. But when we, we got that, we got um, quite a bad five-day forecast and so decided that we were going to try this portage because it doesn't really matter how bad the wind is if you're, if you're carrying a kayak. And so we, we spent a couple of days lifting the boats over the, the inland of the mountain uh, and following a, a lake system that would go in between. Um, which got us through to the other side. Uh, we, we then spent a couple of days stuck on the beach waiting for the weather to improve. Do you enjoy those times when you get stuck um, and kind of storm bound? It can be a mixed blessing, really. The first time we got stuck was actually really quite nice. It snowed overnight, so the snow was quite close down. And we'd been going pretty solid for about 10 or 11 days at this point. And so you're, you're getting pretty tired anyway. And so when the wind got to the point where it wasn't safe to go out um it was quite welcome to be able to spend a day and just sort the kayaks and rest and just really recover uh, in body and soul i have down in my notes here uh peel fjord ah yeah peel fjord peel fjord for us was uh the kind of highlight of our trip the trip itself the shortest we could have done it was about 550 kilometers and we added into that three detours so the first was Pio Onze or Pio 11 uh, which is South America's largest glacier and then the second took us up into a place called Peel Fjord which is difficult to access the very top of unless you're by kayak and you go through a narrow tidal gate which is you're fighting the current and dodging icebergs and which is really quite quite good fun trying to get through uh, and then you suddenly enter this hidden fjord that's just filled with waterfalls of glaciers and just this coliseum of mountains all around you. Uh, and we came in in the evening uh, having paddled up. It took us about two days to paddle up. And we, we got there in the evening. And it was all cloudy and you couldn't really see much. And we, we set camp. Um, still beautiful, sort of fjord full of ice. Uh, but in the next morning, we woke up and there was this thin mist and the sun was lighting everything golden and the mountains were clear and the sun was out and it was just a paradise. After Peel Fjord, I have in my notes Canal de los Mon Montañas. Yeah, so Canal de los Montañas was our final detour. Uh, that was right before we, we finished into Puerto Natales. For me, 
personally, that was uh, that was the end. Once we got to Canal de los Montañas, there was no longer any doubt about whether or not we would get home with enough food and get home on time. So it was kind of like breathing this big sort of sigh of relief. And we could then really explore and enjoy it. And we'd arrived at that point on about day 25. And so I had an enormous amount of food because we'd planned for 45 days. And the, the weather that we'd had allowed us to get quite far, quite fast. And so Seamus and I decided that we would just linger in the Canal de los Montañas, which is this 100 kilometer canal filled with glaciers. Um, they all come pouring off these mountains. Canal de los Montañas literally means canal of the mountains. So these, these mountains are just pouring ice off them. And we just lingered and explored up a river and camped in front of glaciers and just kind of wandered around and explored. And for me, that was one of the highlights of the trip. So part of the adventure is, I wrote it down here in my notes, is a short bog drag <laughs> described <laughs> as, as your final portage. And then you end up having to abseiling, repelling, I think is the word that that I would use. I think it, that means the same thing. Then you, you, you have to drop your kayaks down on rope. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah. Um, so the, the only one of the three portages we did that I had any idea about, um, I've been told by a, a friend that worked in the town that it was a, a short bog drag. And it turned out to be quite a decent haul. Um, it took us, it, we thought it would take us half a day. It took us a whole day, quite a hard day. And we, we rose the boats up about 200 meters. So over the course of the day, really climbing quite high. And right at the end, when we dragged the boats, the boats were about 100 to 120 kilos. So they were heavy. Uh, we were dragging them one by one. You kind of go one, two, three, pull, and then you'd heave. We then changed that to gladiator ready and then pull. But we got to the top, and uh, the descent down was a good sort of 60, 70 degree descent, which with 100, 100 to 120 kilo boat, you're not going to just slide it down because it'll plow into the trees and maybe injure you. Uh, so we ended up having to tie them off and use the, the trees as sort of friction abseils and slide them down, um, which was quite exciting. It was quite a, a good end to the portage. And we emerged on the other side of these mountains to the other side, and it was kind of escaping the fjords. And it felt like we were ending a chapter, so to speak. Is that where you dislocated your thumb? No, that was um, I dislocated my thumb midway through the trip. Funnily enough, trying to push something into my boat, it was a it was a really silly accident. I was trying to get a a bag into the front of my kayak and just pushed a little bit too hard and it popped my thumb out, which managed to relocate and it just stayed a little bit cold for a few days. I must have pinched a nerve or something. It seems like you you finished a little bit ahead of schedule and then you allowed yourself some time to uh, just do some exploring. How was that part of it? Once we'd kind of exhausted ourselves from the, the Canal de los Montañas, we arrived into Puerto Natales uh, ahead of schedule by about, it was about 10 days. Um, so it took us 32 days in total. So we had quite a lot of time to spare. And we, we stayed with, there's a fantastic hostel in Puerto Natales called Erratic Rock, um, where there's a lot of good, good friends, a really lovely atmosphere. And we, we stayed with them and they were, they were doing their, their sort of yearly expedition to go and sort of walk around the Torres del Paine National Park. And so we, we tagged along with them and, and went and did a, a sort of week walking around the mountains and stretching the legs. Because after a month sitting down, it was quite nice to get the legs u- used. What do you see out there for wildlife? Uh, it depends where you go. Patagonia is divided by an ice cap. So on the, the west coast, when we were paddling, uh, we were seeing things like penguins and uh, dolphin were kind of the highlight. Uh, you get the condor, which are these two-meter wingspan birds, massive, massive, great big things. They look like a flying ironing board uh, would come down and inspect the boats. And you'd also get sea lions, which we, we gave quite a wide berth to. We started trying to impersonate them for quite a long time. They sound like Chewbacca. Um, so they do this all along sort of sound, and we'd start trying to call them back. So those were kind of the animals you'd see on the, the West Coast. Uh, a lot of bird life too, so ducks and otters as well uh, were the other, other animal. Now, if you go over to the Torres del Paine National Park, where you're in the, the Pampas, the, the desert area of, of Patagonia, you end up seeing things like Wanaco, which are quite like a, they look like a llama. Uh, and you can see things like the Wemul and the Puma as well, although we didn't see any of those. I'm still searching for Puma out there. Uh, we do, do get them. When you and Seamus were kayaking did you see any other people not really uh so the 
the trip from start to finish uh, is absolutely uh, on your own. There's no roads, there's no access points at all. The quickest and easiest way to get out if something goes wrong is to go back to the start or finish. We never saw or spoke to anyone during the trip, but you would occasionally see a, a boat in the distance go past, which is always quite a nice feeling. Uh, I remember one night waking up from a camp, we saw a cruise liner go past and we were both just amazed at seeing this array of lights. It was like a big Christmas tree out on the water. Um, and after being quite a while without seeing that, it really is kind of mind blowing. Um, and it was strange for us to think that here we were in the middle of nowhere, shivering in a tent and sort of brewing over a gas stove while these people were in such comfort, enjoying something that they couldn't see. What would you say turned out to be the biggest challenge of the adventure? Um... Probably staying warm, I think. We were very lucky in that because we're such good friends, we, we got on brilliantly through the trip. The conditions, although we did get a couple of days, we had one day with about two to two and a half meter waves, although those do pose challenges and the wind pose challenges, we could largely save ourselves from those by allowing time to, to land and get out of them. And when you did get caught out on the water, we just worked slowly and worked together to get ourselves out of it. The hardest thing for us, particularly Seamus, who's taller than I am, um, was keeping warm and keeping our feet warm. Um, now Seamus, being taller, couldn't quite fit in the boat, so his feet were, were buckled, and he had a terrible problem with keeping his toes warm. And again, it's, it's keeping your digits working. I think that's the hardest thing about being out there and being disciplined to keep dry and to keep warm whenever you can. So what kind of temperatures are you in? Uh, the temperatures probably average between 5 and 10 degrees. There were days where the sun came out and because there's not much ozone down there, it would feel like it would be in the 20s, 25s, although those days were rare. Much more common, it would be below five degrees. So it'd be five to towards the end of the trip was getting well into the minuses, minus five, maybe even minus 10. And we were waking up and finding everything covered in frost. But the main thing you get cold from is particularly as you get near the ice, the, the glaciers, as the water gets down to two or three degrees centigrade. Um, and when you're further away from the ice, it goes up to about 10 degrees. But when you're close in, it's like sitting in a great big freezer. Um, and because you're in the water in a kayak, it's, it gets you very wet, uh, very cold, very quickly. What was your favorite part of the adventure? For me, just enjoying being somewhere so out of there um, with my best friend. I mean, both of us just had a real blast. I think the moments when we got really close to the glaciers were the, were the best moments, really, because there's nothing quite as impressive as standing in front of a great big wall of ice and watching it carve off with big splashes and, and just kind of sitting in the in the shadow of these giants. Did you end up doing any science or data collection when you were out there? Uh, no, we didn't. We, we tried to find a camera um, which had been, or we, we looked for it briefly, um, but we never actually found it, uh, which had been left by another science party. The only real science that we did is a sort of personal thing that I quite like doing, um, which is every day in my diary, I'll, I'll mark out my mood. Uh, so however, out of 10, 10 being the best, one being the worst. And at the end of the trip, you can plot your, your mood through the trip. Now, this trip, I, I did that for myself, but also in my diary rated what I thought Seamus's was and then plotted them. And the idea with that was to see kind of if it was a success or not now for me anything over seven out of ten at average is a successful trip uh, and this one came out to be i think 8.2 or 8.3 so it was overall fun and what did seamus's average turn out to be it was about the same um we were both both around about the eight eight out of ten mark will were you able to learn any new anything new in this expedition that you can apply to a future one yeah you always you always learn stuff out of an expedition I've definitely learned a little bit more about cold and wet discipline and particularly with the kayaks and how to get out of the kayak and keep keep dry and warm easier um, and that was particularly through using a tarpaulin uh, I've never used a tarp before uh, and Hilleberg the tent company had thankfully given me a, a tarpaulin and for me that was the biggest sort of eye-opener and just how comfortable you can be with one of those and also having been the first expedition in a while where I've, I've been with somebody else kind of working together as a group and how that works uh, was a good learning point for me. And then there was a couple of other ones as in where things did get broken and where things didn't work, where we kind of figured our way around them. Always, always adds to a little bit of experience. 
What's your favorite piece of kit? Ooh, that's a hard question. Why is it hard? Well, it depends kind of what you think about. Um, a favorite one for keeping me dry would probably have to be my dry suit, which is uh, a Kokata expedition suit, because that, that really made my life more comfortable in the water. And then if you're on the, on the beach, it would have to be the tent, which is a Hilleberg tent, because that, that makes it more comfortable on land. My favorite thing that we took on this trip was something that we'd taken from home, though. Now, we found a long time ago, when we were quite young, we found on the beach uh, a plastic card. And uh, you know when you buy these little jotters, uh, sort of writing jotters, they have a plastic card at the front that protects the paper. Um, it was a bit of trash that we found on the beach, and it was pink. And it had been a game uh, growing up to try and hide it through each other's kayaking kit. Uh, and so when Seamus came down, he brought it down without me knowing and hid it into my kayaking gear. And so the game begun. And through the whole the whole trip, we were hiding the pink card for each other's kit. And in terms of fun for the value, that's definitely the best bit of kit I had in that trip. For those that want to do a similar adventure, what advice would you have for them? The the best bit of advice I can give on on kayaking adventures is it's better if you plan things. Um, but what I always think is the best thing you can do is plan for time. A safe trip is a trip where you have the time to sit ashore and wait if it gets to a point that you're not comfortable going into. There's a famous quote saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad gear. That does apply. If you have the right equipment to go into a trip, it will make your life much more comfortable. Um, I know uh, my old boss did a trip where he did the whole thing in a wetsuit years ago. Uh, and he would have been a lot less comfortable than us in dry suits. However, still possible. Um, but he, like us, allowed himself the time to stay ashore and to wait when things get, get bad. And so the best thing I can say is don't rush it. Will, what's next for you? Uh, next for me, I'm in the process of just finishing off building a van. Uh, so I'm going to become uh, one of those van life dirtbags who, who lives out the back of a car. And I'm going to be driving around Scotland this year, summiting the 221, 2,500 foot mountains uh, through the winter, uh, which I hope will take me to the end of March. And uh, it should keep me busy through the winter, uh, much in the same sort of style as my last Scotland expedition. Uh, although this time I'm hoping to encourage others to come and join me where it's safe and appropriate. What kind of a van is it? Uh, it's an old Ford Transit van. It's not a particularly special van, but I've cladded out the inside and put a bed in and a stove and it should be a sort of simple comfort. Are you going to put some photos up on your website? Yeah, I, I will be. It's uh, Those who follow my Instagram website will have noticed it's been a bit quiet lately. Um, that's because I destroyed my camera and my phone in one fell swoop the other day. But I have replacements on the way and then we'll be putting all sorts of photos up um, once they've arrived. How can people contact you if they want to learn more? The best way to do it is to go through my website, which is uh, willcopestakemedia.com. Failing that, you can find me on Facebook with the same same address uh, or Twitter at Will Copestake, Instagram at Will Copestake. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. If you're planning your own expedition, I'm always happy to give advice as well. And if you're in Scotland, come and join me on a, a winter mountain. Will Copestake, thanks for coming back on the show. And uh, hey, good luck on your next your next season of guiding down in, in Chile, if that happens. And of course, uh, stay safe and warm this winter in that van. It sounds like a fun adventure. Thanks so much. It's uh, been a pleasure talking and uh, hopefully we'll uh, speak to you again. Certainly. Recorded October 17th, 2016. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. <laughs>